on behalf of 934 Gallery, good afternoon. My name is Andy Meyer. I'm the exhibitions director here at the gallery and with me are Ben and Jesse and Ingrid. Um, we're here to discuss their show, Vital Labor. Um, uh, Ingrid, would you like to introduce yourself before we begin? It's Ingrid Lazarowitz. I am the artist talk coordinator for 934 Gallery. If you are not familiar with 934, we are a 100% volunteer gallery um, from executive director to the people running the little shop. We, uh, we do it all ourselves. Um, and one of the things we really enjoy doing is meeting with our artists and normally in a non-pandemic scenario, have a group of people in to ask questions of the artist in a pretty informal uh, discussion style way. Um, and so we're going to try and recreate that here virtually so that uh, all of you in the universe can, can participate. So uh, I guess we'll start out. So do you guys want to introduce yourselves and uh, then we'll talk about the beginning of the show? Sure. Jesse? Yeah. Um, so hello, I'm Jesse Horning. Um, so I am an artist and educator. I mainly make um, prints and drawings, which is the work that's in the show. Um, so I live and work in Columbus and my current jobs are, I work at Ohio State University. I work as the print lab technician there. I also teach printmaking and drawing. And I also teach um, at Columbus College of Art and Design. I teach a history class. I teach Saturday morning art classes. So I make art, I teach art, all that good stuff. Um, and all my, my degrees, I have my bachelor's from Kutztown University in Pennsylvania. Um, and I have my master's um, from Ohio State University, all in printmaking, printmaking all the time. Nice. Ben? Cool. Uh, yeah, yeah, and I'm Ben Cavone. Uh, I'm a artist currently living and working in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Uh, I focus mainly in sculpture, uh, primarily wood and construction materials. Um, I have a BA in art education from Hartwick College in Oneonta, New York, and then I got my MFA from Columbus College of Art and Design uh, in 2016, I think it was. And I currently work as a woodshop supervisor, kind of uh, teaching and uh, working with students at the Milwaukee Institute of Art and Design, so. Sweet, yeah, that's awesome. Um, before we kind of get into the more conceptual aspects of the show, uh, maybe we can just discuss um, perhaps the title and maybe your thoughts on the type of work that you chose to exhibit uh, together in this show. Sure. Um, maybe, Jesse, if you want to start, perhaps? Yeah, um, so the title, Vital Labor, um, well, I guess to start off, the I remember talking to Andy about pairing our work together, and in general, you know, my work has this kind of like organic, kind of natural look to it. Um, there's a lot of texture and plants and organic type stuff. Um, and Ben's work is a lot more kind of mechanical, like construction, more kind of the opposite of the aesthetic of my work. So I remember Andy saying that he thinks that that would be like an interesting kind of contrast to have those two works in the same space. Um, it also works nice because my stuff just hangs on the wall and like Ben's stuff goes on the floor. So it's like, all right, we're all good. Um, logistically. Um, but... So yeah, kind of the aesthetic of our work is an interest, they kind of complement and work off each other. Um, I could talk about the title. Ben, do you want to talk about the title or? You can take it away and I'll jump in. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so the title, cause we were paired together for the show and then we're like, all right, what are we going to call the show? Um, so we were going back and forth talking about, you know, for Ben making, for both of us making work is like basically a compulsion or this like necessary practice that we need to do. Um, so that's kind of, you know, where the title came from, this idea of vital, vital labor, um, things that are like necessary to do. Um, 
and also both of our work requires a lot of labor. Yeah, so I'll leave it at that. Ben, what do you think? Yeah, I think that that's definitely um, kind of the direction I remember leaning towards when you and I were discussing the title. I know we went back and forth about um, these ideas of, you know, even just the word choice behind, you know, how necessary our labor was. We're talking about like compulsive or, you know, necessary or whatever. But for us, you know, we kind of just came down to the fact that just like as makers, and I think a lot of creatives have the same mentality where, you know, we just feel a compulsion to make things, you know, and we have a ne- like a necessity in our, you know, a weird animal brain up top there just to, you know, we need to make things. And for, I think one of the things that's interesting to me about that whole concept is that for people, um, and Ingrid, you and I talked about this a little bit yesterday, there's this idea of how it's a difference, uh, necessity and vitalness for every person. Like me as an artist, I don't really sketch or draw. I'm not like a sketchbook keeper or anything like doesn't work for me. But like I, you know, to flush out ideas and stuff, I like have a bunch of Legos in my room and stuff and it helps me just like build stuff. You know, it's just, I think it's a really interesting thing to identify the different necessities of the labor in our practice person to person. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Um, And then it's almost thinking about your work, Ben, it's almost ironic, the title vital labor, because you touch on some ideas where um, I'm just thinking of the whole Carhartt brand and how you kind of use that as a, you know, the, the idea of the brand and how it's kind of conformed from a working person's brand to this iconic designer type of aesthetic. Yeah. Um, you know, if we're able to pull up an image work, um, we should do that as we're talking about it. Um, but maybe we can start touching into those more conceptual aspects of the show, like how vital labor relates um, the work itself, for sure. Sure. So, Ben, you and I yesterday talked a lot, and, and Jesse, too, that, so, like, you, as you guys said, um, it's, it's, what story do we tell, right? What story are you telling with your work? So, it's this compulsion to make art, but the making and the, the actual sensory piece of the making is important and inherent to each of your process. Because there is this, um, there's a layering for each of you within that. So what kind of connotations does that now take on? Because Ben, you were discussing the commodification, right? The commodification of working, a working person's aesthetic. Yeah. And then what role you as the artist also play in that? Yeah. Um, that's something that I've just been really fascinated in, especially in, I'd say, like, the last, you know, year or two, um, just definitely interested in seeing how, um, you know, kind of coming from my background and then working around a lot of people in the trades and stuff, working construction in college, and seeing how this idea of the visual aesthetic of, you know, skilled labor in the trades, um, has become, uh high fashion in a way and it's become hyper commodified for you know people kind of want to look that way you know but they don't do that in a way and you know figuring out where i kind of fall into that as well you know i think it's um this personal narrative that i have to have with myself a lot because like i also you know dress like that um as much because i like it i think it's high fashion um i think it you know is visually aesthetically pleasing like I'm wearing a flannel right now like every other art kid in the world Uh, so just interested in seeing how these visual cues you know whether it's a particular material like um, denim or a set of boots or a logo or something um, you know has reached this sort of like weird echelon of high fashion um, you know and And, and kind of also identifying where I Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, And streetwear and the aesthetic of that. 
and also kind of where I fall into that too, you know, because like I've worked construction and I work in a wood shop, but I'm by no means a tradesperson. You know, I'm not any sort of skilled or in that life. So, you know, identifying you know where I fall into that, and then also um, having that continual dialogue of if it's okay for me to even talk about that type of thing. You know, like what what right do I have to kind of dive in and ex- expose that sort of stuff? Where is it, and when does it turn into co-option? In, in a sense. You know, worrying about if I'm talking about and seeing this work and exploring this idea of how society is kind of commodifying and hypnotizing this sort of world, but then also seeing that I too am doing that, you know, mm-hmm. like where's that line? If the line's even there. Have I crossed it already? I don't know. So That's right now we have a question from Facebook that actually goes in, in with that which is kind of what was the inspiration for each of the collections initially. So, I mean, Ben, you're starting into that, but maybe rewind a little into like, what was the inspiration for this particular set and, and kind of what you're trying, what you're communicating? Sure. So with the works that I have in this show um, specifically, um, I was trying to, identify these sort of visual signifiers um, from, you know, like a construction site or a trade site, whatever it might be, um, and stuff that I've interacted with in the past and can remember doing and um, trying to take them and either elevate them to a higher, um, you know, visual aesthetic or just to kind of, I guess, poke fun a little tongue in cheek about these um, ideas and stuff that people experiences that people can relate to. Um, One of the things that I've been really interested in in my research and then also in the work that I made for this show was how so many of these items have become super um, highly finished, I guess you would say, Um, looking at different brands where things like, you know, raw selvage denim, which was originally developed because that's just how denim was made and it was made for farmers and trades folk. Um, now goes for, you know, $300 a pair, you know, Levi's has their, um, I think Levi's made original brand or something along those lines where it's, And you you were talking yesterday about wishing you had red wing boots, but can't afford them. Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, again, red wing boots made for iron workers and, you know, concrete work and masonry are now, you know, out of the price range of somebody who might be doing that work. It's this really fascinating thing to me. So I try to take these objects that you would see, you know, people would maybe associate again with that sort of world and just elevate them to a higher level, whether it's through visual um, choice, material usage, uh, um, processing of the material. So like um, the piece, the morning break, which is the one with the milk crates is, you know, the idea of taking your morning break, just sitting on a milk crate and like having a smoke and drinking your coffee, except now it's a milk crate that's made out of like ash and walnuts and has really fine um, joinery techniques on it. And it's all finished and cleaned up and it's kind of elevated up like a throne almost and then um the piece support which is those yeah sawhorses you know everybody divine that are beat up and thrown in the back and they're made to just be you know destroyed but i created these ones that are made out of um douglas fir and they're uh, finished up to like 400 grit and oiled with Danish oil and they have leather upholstery on top and brass finishers so it's like these weird high-end objects that uh you know you'd see in I don't know like an apartment or like a anthropology or Uh something like that I just think it's I think it'd be really funny to see a set of um like bespoke sawhorses in a pottery barn you know which I'm pretty sure they're already out there for being totally honest yeah definitely but but that's down to even the materials being super specific for you. Mm-hmm. So yeah. it's not just the aesthetic of it, but the, the physical, you were discussing yesterday, the physical process of it. So, you know, if do you mind telling the story about when you, they, you had the friend who said that you spend more time making, <laughs> the right, that's a great yeah. one. I think that's a good uh, explanation yeah. of your process. Sure. So I think part of the, this actually ties into my personal 
um, highlight with the idea of vital labor where I'm really drawn to sort of both repetitive and labor intensive practices in my work, whether it's, you know, finishing or joinery techniques or building um, constructions. Um, and uh, um, so when I was in grad school, um, I actually started in as a painter and um, I remember going through and I was stretching canvases for some paintings, which um, I won't even talk about how bad those paintings were, but um, I was spending all this time stretching the canvases and putting together the frame and stretching and re-stretching, stretching the can because I wanted it to be really, you know, I like for when I have a painting for it to be like a drum, you know, like I'd like bounce a penny off of it type of situation. And somebody walked by, I don't remember, it was late at night, and it was in a caffeine haze, and um, somebody walked by and asked what I was doing, and I explained to them this process of how I stretch and let it ease up the tension, and then restretch my canvas over and over again to get it really tight, and I think they just said, you know, that's really labor intensive you know why are you painting you know you should be building stuff and I kind of just sat there on the floor with my canvas pliers in my hands and I was like that's a good question and <laughs> so towards the end of that semester and into the next semester um, I just decided to go with that you know and it was something that I'd always done and knew and I uh, I think I was a little afraid of it at first but uh, it's worked out well so far so yeah that's kind of when I made the pivot to more uh, strictly sculptural focused practice. So, but in this particular show, that so it's even down to the, you know, the materials that, you know, the woods that you, you use or the rivets that you use or the way that the wood is joined, um, the materials themselves tell a story in some ways for you. Yeah, absolutely. Does that sound accurate? Okay. So then, Jesse, for you, inspiration for the show, what, for this collection of work? Yeah, I would say um, the best way to answer that is, um, let's see, um, I think just thinking about, like, some of the main threads in my work or some of the main ways that I make work or think about a drawing. Um, so as I was talking with you about yesterday, Ingrid, we talked about, um, you know, so when I, and again, this is, these are threads that are in every single work that's in the show. Um, and when I have a show, just to kind of note this, when I have a show, it's basically kind of, it's always like my recent work. I never, I work very intuitively. I work very process-based. Um, I don't think, oh, I'm going to make a collection of like these images. Um, all my images are pulled from like a personal photo archive. So that's definitely a unifying factor of my work. Um, but yeah, I definitely never like say, I'm going to make pictures of these figures. Um, it's very intuitive. So, but yeah, the, the main threads that are in this body of work, um, things that I really care about in my studio practice, um, I'm interested in this idea that the space of the drawing of the paper that I'm drawing on, it's not necessarily that this like illusionary picture plane where I'm presenting a scene or a landscape or trying to create this illusion. I'm more interested in um, the space of the drawing paper as like a collection space for mark making and imagery and letting all those kind of elements, the process of drawing, build up and accumulate on the surface of the paper over time. Um, so that's how I approach drawing. Um, I don't know, I like making drawings that really record and reflect the process of drawing and kind of this process of observing, recording, um, things forming over time as you develop them more through the drawing. Um, let's think. What else do I think about with my studio practice? Um, yeah, and then I have some little notes on the side. I'm like, oh. Yeah. Um, so yeah, and the other thing too is it's all personal imagery. It's 
photographs that I'm drawing from. That's what I thought was, that was one of the pieces that I thought was just so fascinating when we spoke yesterday, is that, you know, you're using your laptop and social media to see images, but they are images from real life, your people you know, and moments in your life, correct? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because um, when, when I'm drawing for like hours at a time, um, you know, it's a certain space that you kind of mentally and emotionally get into. Mm -hmm. um, so I've found that I want to kind of spend that time like thinking about certain things or like people that mean something to me or places that mean something to me. Um, and then all of that is kind of captured in the drawing. Yeah. Nice. Jesse, but I have then, a question for you. Um, you and I, for the people who don't know, you and I were actually both at OSU at the same time. I was getting my undergrad as you were getting your MFA. So it was really interesting yeah. to see your process behind the scenes a little bit. Um, just thinking about vital labor um, and your the actual printmaking techniques you use on the press, um, I was thinking it might be interesting to talk about the labor that, is, that goes into making print and what processes you use. Um, I know you use centerboard a lot, so maybe you could talk about that uh, process of using centerboard and the seeds and string and different embossment techniques you use on your prints that are so evident and so, so thoughtful yeah. and nice. Basically, um, when I was in grad school, I was, um, I became aware or I was introduced to um, a particular printmaking surface called Sintra board, which is this kind of like plastic printmaking plate surface. Um, and the thing that's really, that I found really interesting about Sintra board is that if I ran it through the press with like seeds and string and toothpicks and other things that wouldn't like ruin the press, you know, kind of breakable little things, they would embed into the plate and create an analog mark. So I've been able to create these printmaking plates that have these very analog marks of, um, you know, again, like we were talking about how my work has this kind of organic or natural look to it. A lot of that is because I'm literally like impressing these objects into the plate and then being able to ink the plate and then those, um, you know, um, uh, surfaces and textures will all be printed onto my drawing. Is this a technique where you're able to reproduce like as you run it through the press will it become more and more flattened out and it will become less embossed or does that that impression maintain throughout the edition? Oh look at that right there with the that is exciting. yeah is it? and so that um so to answer so that little thing we're looking at right now mm -hmm. I'm like oh so many thoughts um so yeah. the so what you're looking at, those are actual plants that I put on the plate in between the plate, the ink, the paper, and then the plant acts as kind of an analog stencil. Mm -hmm. um, and in even some of the prints, they're black and white, but they have these little pigments from the plants where like the green of the plant was like, becomes part of the paper. Um, mm -hmm. But to answer Andy's question, um, yeah, the plates are like surprisingly durable. Like I squish these like, impressions into them and then they just stay there um through like many printings um which is really nice because i think if they kind of flattened out i'd be like man not working so well but yeah that's great yeah and I, I love the fact that you're making the digital physical about how you're you're almost like stenciling and tracing things that we view digitally onto a physical and very naturally like it, it looks like a natural substance um your printmaking and mark making uh details um so does that kind of tie into the the vital labor idea a little bit how you're taking photos you're referencing photos and turning them into a more hand-drawn analog image kind of yeah yeah that definitely speaks to my work in general um i'm always interested in kind of tension or contrast um between digital and analog um imagery and processes um that might be because I'm a printmaker, like working with processes and presses and materials that are hundreds, like when you take a printmaking class, you're basically like learning history or like you're working with history in like this crazy way. Um, so yeah, printmaking is extremely analog. It's kind of the opposite 
of all the digital technologies that we engage with all the time. Like, I feel like all I do anymore is sit in front of my laptop, you know? So, um, yeah, I'm always very interested in this um, contrast. What happens when you take digital imagery, digital icons, digital symbols, and what happens when you render those or translate those into ink and paper and like tactile because to me digital feels very intangible to mm -hmm. an extent and then paper and ink feels very tangible so i'm always kind of mashing those two together and kind of seeing what happens right and then ben in your work you you use some digital as well on top of your your beautifully constructed <laughs> Can we pull um, this up? Can we pull up the can we can we pull up the picture of the with the saw horses? Yeah, yeah, we'll pull up some of those images right now. Um, um, yeah, so kind of Ben, can you talk about how the physical interacts with the digital in your work as well? Yeah. So my work for this piece that's a still of um, a piece a video loop that's playing on that TV on top of those saw horses. Um, Mine, sort of similar, but also a little bit different than what Jesse was talking about. One of the things that I'm really interested in, in this idea of the sort of like high fashion and commodification of workwear and that aesthetic and the culture and everything is this huge presence of this sort of um, Instagram culture and social media culture of people kind of involved in this world, especially the ones that are really involved in the more high fashion um, world of, you know, workwear or streetwear. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that I find myself scrolling through constantly is on Instagram discovery is all these people um, who call, you know, boot bros or denim heads or all these people from around the world that go through and their entire social media presence is of these different you know poses to both reflect their supposed you know ruggedness not you know trying to make fun of everybody but also to show off the items that they're wearing and there's even down to the point of like specific terms for these different poses and stuff you know mm -hmm. they have to go down and they do a cuff check to show the selvage on their denim and also to can show you, off their can you skin. show us can you show can you can you can you show us the cuff check uh i cannot right now um but <laughs> uh no but it's you know you, you take a get down on one knee and you have to like roll up the cuff of your jeans to look for um, the selvage and also to show off your fancy Norwegian print bespoke socks type of situation. Um, and then there's, you know, the pose where you're, you know, standing or you're just kind of like in mid action. So, and I just thought it was really interesting to see how all of these people, oh, nice. oh yeah, there's my video. There there we go. Uh, video that was playing on that yeah, television. Uh, that's the cuff check right there. Sort of. Right. And, you know, different poses in their different areas around um, different places. And um, wow, that's fun. So these are this. the poses you would see on your Instagram discovery exactly. about. Exactly. But I'm kind of just going through doing them almost like you'd see on a photo shoot, which is something that I've seen people doing this, like in my travels around the country. You know, they'll pick a street, a wall on the side of a building, and they'll go through all those to try and get the right shot to post on their Instagram. Um, and so that was something that I was really interested in seeing, especially because you see all these different feeds and they're all, you know, kind of unique in their own way. But when you kind of zoom out and look at them as a whole, especially on certain pages, or if you just kind of flip back and forth, it all ends up coming down to like the, they're all technically doing the same thing and they're all kind of visually representing themselves in the same way, kind of the same ideas, um, same style choices even you know that type of thing so it was interesting to me to see that different world that there's all these different things happening and then how they all kind of come together into one um, kind of unanimous I guess set of poses and so I was originally taking images to kind of have on like a slideshow loop almost and um, I was working with the, one of my friends who helps photograph my work and was helping this and I was just kind of going through the poses and couldn't really get them to be how I wanted. So we just started shooting video and I kind of spliced that all together. And that, um, it was also kind of me making 
fun of myself a little bit for doing it, you know, because of just wearing stuff that I found at, you know, Goodwill or Walmart and stuff like that. Kind of these signifiers um, going from there. I feel like I've been using the word signifier a lot, but yeah. <laughs> no, I was, I was going to ask, do you find yourself living outside that world or are you a quote unquote victim of, of doing or of living in that world as well, I guess? Uh, yeah, I definitely I'm ask almost the same thing in terms of because both of you are talking about the artist's interaction with social media, right? In some way, like it's mm -hmm. your personal Jesse for you, it's your personal interaction with some of these images, and they those are built into it. And and this is about you know your interaction and what role you play in it. So it's it's both both sets of work I think are very self reflective in that way. Yeah. And to answer Andy's question, it's definitely, um, I in no way, shape or form think of myself as like totally distanced from that world. You know, I'm absolutely like one of the, I still, you know, I've been window shopping and online shopping through that this whole time. Um, just cause I, in terms of, you know, just fashion and aesthetic choices, like I really enjoy the work, you know, I've, mm -hmm. uh, kind of, that's one of the questions and discussions I have with myself a lot is, um, you know, where do I fall in that? You know, am I trying to um, steer away from that? Do I want to fully embrace it? And if I'm embracing it, even in some point, am I allowed to kind of, um, you know, make these tongue in cheek comments about it? Um, and that was one of the reasons I kind of just put myself in it in these video pieces. Um, and Ingrid, you and I talked about this a little bit last night as well. That's very different. I mean, it's a different you know, level of vulnerability than yeah. any of your previous work. Yeah, it's the first time that I've had any sort of visual reference um, to me, you know, in any of my work on display. Like I haven't done any sort of portraiture or anything like that in years outside of, you know, class assignments uh, back in undergrad. And so just, you know, I've kind of figured if I'm gonna be sort of poking fun at this, I might as well poke fun at it by making fun of myself and doing these goofy poses in a parking lot, you know, off of, um, over by my old studio in Columbus at Millworks. So uh, yeah, you know, I just thought it was kind of goofy and um, I enjoyed doing it. It was really fun to just kind of go through these weird model poses in a parking lot on some cinder blocks. Yeah. yeah. All right, I have, a, I have a question from the ethos here. Um, she asked, does he identify more with the working man or more with the fancy man or more in between? And has he ever had an identity crisis? All right, existential <laughs> theory, let's roll. There we go, we're getting deep. <laughs> um, so I like to think now, um, you know, current, even just with my current occupation and job, I identify a little bit more with that. I've always kind of wanted to identify a little bit more with that. Um, just because, you know, growing up, um, my dad was sort of one of those Renaissance men of the mid 20th century that even though, you know, he's an engineer nine to five, but he, you know, we built our deck at our house and he worked as a mechanic and, you know, he knows how to fix and build pretty much anything that you can There's a of. right way to do things. And yeah. And, you know, I think we had people come do work on our house in the 27 years that they've lived there, probably like three times, you know, and yeah. so two of the times it was just because my dad, you know, just couldn't do it just himself, much to his chagrin. Um, so it's always something that I've really wanted to identify with, and I'm working towards getting there. Um, that's a, something that I'm really um, interested in doing, but I mean, I'm in no way, like I said earlier, like I'm not a tradesmen um even my carpentry and woodworking skills are still very much in sort of like the not high novice low intermediate level um to answer the question from the ethos i don't really identify as a fancy person but i think with some fashion choices people have thought like i'm totally like a urban lumberjack hipster at this point living in wisconsin lumberjack chic. Own that. yeah lumberjack chic i own that um, definitely had a bunch of identity crises about the whole thing. Um, kind of have one like once a week, half the time. Um, but you know, I think that's part of being an artist too, you know, but yeah, no, I, <laughs> that's funny. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I'm not that fancy, but I'm a little fancy. Nice. That's good. Yeah. Um, Jesse, do, do any of those topics, uh, relate to your work? Like, do you, 
is your identity, I guess, kind of interwoven within the images, like of the figures and the, you know, the the family, you know, the groups of people arriving together in your drawings? Are those you per se, or are those your your friends, possibly, something like that? Yeah, I guess. Um, well, again, all of it's like from personal archives. Yeah. So everyone in the drawings, like anyone who you know has known me while. I've lived in Columbus will probably recognize people in those images. Um, yeah, so I think I am definitely not, I don't really have any interest currently in like drawing myself, like any self portraits, but I do think that my drawings and the imagery in there, the fact that they're connected to me and friends, family, people that I care about, um, you know, it's, it's a self portrait in that way, um, kind of, one degree of separation or however like an extension or however you want to describe it you you described it yesterday one of the phrases you said is that that your drawing is a record of that, that drawing is a record of what you're looking at in the moment exactly what you as the artist are seeing not just the image itself that you're staring at but also it's like a it's like a snapshot of your moment staring at that screen and then working with that image. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of, there's imagery from, you know, like we were talking about yesterday, just like so many layers, because there's the layer of like, the family photograph that's living inside of my laptop screen, where I have a collection of film, physical paper photographs that sometimes I draw from holding a photograph in your hand and drawing that imagery is a very different experience than navigating through interfaces and pixels and laptops. So I think a lot about how I view the images and kind of my relationship to the images based on if they're analog, if they're on a piece of paper, if they're digital, if they exist as these electric, I'm like, what's a pixel? I, I don't know, electricity, light, I don't, you know, and so, and with that, I also think about things being tangible and intangible and how, you know, is a, my sister is a photographer and I had an interesting conversation with her where I was saying how images that are made of like pixels are more fragile because it's like a pixel or electricity, you know, you drop water on it, your hard drive goes out. Um, mm -hmm. But then, you know, and then if you have like a physical film photograph it's more it's less fragile but my sister's like but if you have a digital file you can like make a backup and if you just have a piece of paper so it's just like all this type of stuff like these highly emotional images for me that really like are part of my identity that I have a certain amount of anxiety with like preserving them and then I feel like mm -hmm. I want to draw them to engage with them so it's just like there's anxiety there's nostalgia it's just across the I don't know if that answered the question. I think I started talking about other stuff, but no, no, it is. That's that's perfect because I like that that bit at the end about like it's it, it's a record of the way that you the of the of the way you have preserved and you've engaged with a memory. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's not not the image itself, but then you go through a very intensive layering process once you have done the drawing itself. Sometimes there's an additional, there's that additional printmaking piece. So um, you talked, you know, I don't know if you could circle back a little to the, your idea of the mark making, seeing the paper, as I said, like the, your philosophy on, on how you see blank paper as the space for mark making, a collection. Yeah. Um, I think the best way to answer that is um, how we were talking about because my imagery gets like, I work in intuitively and then I kind of arrive at these like ambiguous, more abstract images that have like elements of familiarity in them, but then they're also like not this representational convention. Um, so yeah, I think when I add like the printmaking imagery, it's another way for me to kind of add like value or texture um yeah and kind of these elements that, 
that make an image visually compelling. Printmaking is another way for me to add another type of mark into the drawing. Um, and that mark is very different than the mark that my hand is gonna make. Um, so, and also these analog marks that I'm able to achieve using the Sintra, it, it gives this like analog imagery into the drawing where when I'm making the drawing, I'm kind of making these little figures or these little landscapes, but then you layer on this like physical impression of like one-to-one -one ratio of like string or seeds or plants. And then that creates this other layer. Again, I don't, I'm like, is that answering the question? No, absolutely. <laughs> Do you ever use the mark making with the printmaking? Because I, I would just, it, it, does the print, the printmaking comes as a secondary process always, correct? You don't start with the print, you start with the drawing. Yeah, the way I wouldn't be opposed to starting with the print, but the way that I have been working recently, I'll kind of make a drawing and then I will, um, you know, maybe it'll be finished as a drawing. It'll get finished that way. Or if it feels like it needs something else, then I'll kind of turn to printmaking and see what kind of marks I can add using print processes. Okay. And then do you ever use those print processes not to just add marks, but to cover pieces up with yeah. the image? Yeah, that's a good, because there's a print process called Sheen Collet, um, which is yeah. basically a process. Andy's like, oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> remember that, remember that those of you who don't know andy meyer is also an extremely talented printmaker yeah, yeah i push ink through screens every so <laughs> often um so yeah there's this uh printmaking process um called sheen collet where you're literally taking this like thin piece of paper um and none of the works in this show have i don't think i i don't think any of the works in this show have that process but um yeah, you're able to kind of like a glue or layer a, a thin piece of paper that will be kind of translucent. And then that can kind of cover up part of a drawing. So it's this like super analog, like not Photoshop, but like it has elements of like, you know, it's like, oh, I want to get rid of that. Like I can layer this on top, but it's just like super slow motion analog, hundreds mm -hmm. of years old printing process. So. And so now neither of you, despite the fact you're both working in uh, things that are traditionally like pr both printmaking and a kind of the, the sculptural stuff is, it tends to, especially woodworking, tends to be a pretty linear and thought out and planned out and mathematical process. But both of you, I found when we just, when we talked yesterday, work from a very intuitive place and don't know where you're headed when you start, which is very different than a lot of artists work. So maybe you guys could both talk a little bit about that process because you're working in a field where it's normally a little more linear and both of you approach it from very different angles than traditionally I think we see. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. Um. I think yeah, I'll dive in on that one. Yeah, as a sort of an artist and a maker, especially working in woodworking, and I work in a shop currently that is um, primarily geared towards more like functional objects, uh, making like furniture and uh, industrial design modeling and things like that. So that is a very, you know, linear sort of process versus the concepting and then the initial drafting and then the planning for it and then the actual fabrication and stuff. And me with more of a sculptural background, I, I don't know, I just can't uh, work in that sort of aspect. I never start a piece and then finish it all the way through and then be done with it and start on another one. Like I was telling you last night, Ingrid, I usually work on like, I think I had like Initially, I had six pieces planned for the show, and they were all in various states of completion, kind of in these little tucked away hide corners around the shop. Um, and for me, it's more of, um, you know, like I said, I don't sketch necessarily. I'll have a rough idea of like what I want to create, and I might do some rough measurement tests and stuff. But for the most part, it is kind of just more of an intuitive thing where, you know, I have an idea of I want to create this object. I figure out what I'm going to, you know, 
a base material of what I'm going to make it out of, whether it's wood or concrete or fabric, whatever it might be, a combination of those. And then I just kind of start building. Um, that's like my version of sketching. Um, I took a bunch of cues from some of my friends and coworkers. Yesterday, just and 3D. I loved that. Yeah. Thing. Sketching 3D, I guess. Um, it's something I learned and picked up from uh, friends and like my, one of my coworkers who's a furniture maker. And he uses, you know, if he's building a chair um, that's eventually going to be made out of like really nice walnut, he'll build the entire thing and dry fit it out of just poplar just to test things out. So I generally I'll go through and I'll pick up the material I'm going to make the final product out of. And then I just get a bunch of sort of low grade scrap stuff to practice and try out and kind of go from there. I kind of sketch with little maquettes or, you know, joinery tests and things along those lines. But that's kind of my process I think that answered the question but yeah I don't have a linear process in any way shape or form and Jesse how about you are you also do kind of take it on a little differently yeah I I think it's I'm sitting here thinking about I think it's interesting how Ben and I are both like lab technicians because it's like you know anything that's like um, these very technical, like historical, whatever you want, like process. Yeah, yeah, like process. Yeah, and like, um, yeah, so a couple things like, um, my, well, I was very interested in what Ben was saying about sketches because I, when I was younger, when I was younger, I had um, tons of like sketchbooks and this and that, but I'm at the point where, and I think this factors into like this accumulation over time, like, I'm way more interested in these like kind of spontaneous improvisational expressive sketches. I've always been way more interested in the sketch or like the early phases of the image um, as opposed to like this finished potentially overworked image. Um, so because when I was first learning printmaking it wasn't until I got to grad school that I really felt like learning about Sintra board like really resonated with me that print process because a lot of the traditional I've tried all the traditional print processes but um the mark making in those processes was too mediated and it wasn't direct and immediate enough for me like I just want to like get the mark on the thing I just want to like put it on the paper um and have it there and it's again this kind of record of my activity or process um so yeah, it's, um, yeah, and it's funny because I teach printmaking and if I teach the intro classes, sometimes I have to be careful because like Ben, I go about my work in a very non-linear, almost like cyclical way. So that's what you said. You said yesterday, you used the phrase, you said, I work in a cyclical and responsive, intuitive manner. And I love yeah. that phrasing. Yeah, yeah, because I always think of, and I think Ben might agree or have the same mindset, like, when I'm working with a printing press, I'm, like, collaborating with the printing press. I'm not, like, mm -hmm. exerting my control over the printmaking press and saying, I want this color thing. Like, I'm just seeing what the press can do, and then I bring what I can do, and then we see what happens. Um, that's how I like to go about it, because that kind of, moment of surprise or like um serendipity whatever you want to call it spontaneity, I think you talked about it as spontaneity yesterday there's yeah, spontaneity yeah. in the work yeah because I guess the way and then I'll kind of because I'm like oh I could talk about this forever um but like that's what keeps me interested because if I like know what's going to happen and I know what I'm going to do why do I need to do it like if I know what's going to happen like okay like it's not as exciting and kind of intellectually or mentally engaging for me so now both of you uh, both of you are educators um and both of you are working in shops where you tend to get to work on your own work so during the quarantine Things have shifted, I would imagine, in your processes um, and kind of the paralysis that comes with that because both of you work in, in things that require space and supply. 
far more than perhaps one room could hold. So how, what, what kind of changes has that, have that brought about for you artistically? Um, or I mean, how are you looking through it? Yeah, uh, for me, you know, not to sound dramatic, but it so far has kind of like completely halted my practice because I've kind of, you know, not in a negative way, but I feel like I've kind of gravitated my practice towards um, object and making that is very, you know, shop reliant. I'm very reliant on the wood shop. That was one of the reasons um, that I was really excited to find this job opportunity was the fact that, you know, I was allowed and encouraged project with shop around the students to kind of, um, show them that, you know, we also are makers, you know, we kind of, you know, we're not just talking the talk, we can walk the walk as well. Um, and, you know, like my current institution that I work at is shut down for the quarantine, you know, for um, important and really good reasons. Um, so I've definitely had to um, adjust to that, even just in like my day to day plan, like I'm, um, you know, you said you've become nocturnal. <laughs> yeah. They have become nocturnal, which is fun yeah. and not really, it's basically like being back on my old grad school schedule. Um, but uh, yeah, it's definitely kind of made me adjust, um, you know, kind of taking a step back. Um, personally at mine, we're working on ways of aging with students to figure out ways of getting those more 3D oriented students, um, figuring out stuff that they can do, like just in their living room even. So I've gone back to just like some, we were talking about it last night, Ingrid, some just old school like carving and whittling, you know, so I've got a bunch of, you know, my hand tools and knives and I'm making spoons and little figurines and stuff like that just to engage in that. But um, other than that, yeah, I haven't been <laughs> making a whole lot of anything because I just don't have any of my access or anything. And my, even my hand power tools are at in the lovely care of 934 currently. So, uh, yeah, I multiple states away. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Jesse? What is it? Because it's been, because it, similarly, you yeah. have not the access or the access to your students either. Yeah. Um, so, the past month, I have made, um, I'm just kind of taking it day by day and like, I haven't made any work and I'm fine with that. Like, um, well, I'm not, but it's also like, whatever I feel like, I know, honestly, I'm, I'm thinking I'm on the edge of something coming back here, like in terms of me, like making a drawing. Um, mm -hmm. But obviously there's been a lot to hold our attention. Um, and it also comes back to this idea of like, the world is so different and we were just making our work in a certain world and now the world is a little different. So what does that mean for our work? Um, but yeah, I, I am lucky. I'm lucky in the sense that if you want to make, you know, a drawing, you just need a piece of paper and whatnot. Um, so I have that, but my main issue right now is, um, as I was telling Ingrid yesterday, I have very limited, like I have a apartment, I'm currently sitting in one of two rooms in my efficiency apartment. You know, there's like carpet in the other room. I probably shouldn't get too crazy in there because I don't want my landlord to not give me my security pot, you know. So um, I have extremely limited space right now. Um, but I know that I think soon I'll be able to get into something because I've needed a month to do whatever I've been doing mentally. And also I'm, I'm teaching remotely. Yeah, so I'm trying to like talk to my students and be like, hey, we're making online, what's up? <laughs> um, so that's been intriguing. Um, they've been coming up with cool stuff. So, so that's yeah. What you said is that it's been inspired, the, the, the creativity of your students and how they're adjusting to this has been kind of inspiring for you in terms yeah. of your creativity in terms it creativity in terms of spatially working it out yeah yeah because they're in like a room or wherever they are and they're like making their work and making it making their work and making it um so yeah it's it's definitely possible i'm just very 
I'm just giving myself a lot of um, leeway in terms of mental and emotional. Um, yeah, there's been those things online where people start getting in fights with each other where it's like someone posted like, oh, if you don't come out of this with like a new skill, you wasted your time. And then other people are like, no, that's dumb. And I'm like, yeah, that it like, I don't know. I'm a very, and then I'll um, wrap it up with what I'm saying. But like, I have no question. I'm an extremely productive person. And Ben, I'm sure we probably all are. But it's like, given the situation right now, like cut yourself some slack yeah going on for sure yeah um i have one more question kind of talking about this current event that we all find ourselves in um how does the show titled vital labor interpose with our now new normal pandemic era in which workers provide labor on the basis of whether they are essential or non-essential vital or non-vital we did talk about that yesterday with both of you. That's exciting. All right, quit it. Yeah, how do you, obviously you could have never predicted, you know, when you came up with the title originally that this would have occurred, but, but yeah, how do, you, how do you feel about the show's title and the conceptual nature of it kind of relating to our current events we find ourselves in? If at all. <laughs> the show, because the show opened as one show in one world, right? Mm -hmm. And then yeah. in yeah. the middle of the show, we're in another world after this inflection point. So what is this show, which is still up, how has it morphed as a unit, kind of? <laughs> um, ben, oh, Ben, it looks like you're about to say something. I'm trying to process it, you go. Um, <laughs> well, I guess, so, um, well, I don't know. I would, I don't know if this relates to what Andy said, but I was thinking in terms of like, this time and the arts and like the necessity of the arts and again I look at the internet a lot throughout the day so things that I reference are like this is what I saw online um but you know people posting about how oh it's interesting how we're all stuck in our house what are we turning to we're turning to Netflix we're turning to performance and art and all this stuff um and it's showing how kind of vital and necessary um art is um but yeah that conversation with like labor and i don't know if we're getting into like essential workers and groceries i don't know if that's where that's going but that's a whole other thing where it's like I think so, because they keep kind of transposing the idea of essential versus expendable labor right and and we're seeing that to a certain extent you know what is essential workers what are and and who those people are um so I think, you know, and, and Ben, I think your work already speaks to that. So how has this, this change kind of made your work talk different, speak a different language, kind of? Yeah, um, I'm narrative. still you know, kind of talking about that and figuring out how, um, you know, it, like you mentioned, like the title of the show has taken on kind of a much different context in the last month or so than I think either myself or Jesse could have ever, you know, considered. Uh, but that's something that I'm really kind of diving into and thinking about, you know, in some research and some things along those lines, because it is interesting to see, like, even me and my, you know, I venture out of the house, like, every once every 10 days to go to the grocery store and, you know, re-up and, the people you see out there are, are, you know, our essential workers like the grocery store people and people at the post office. And then the other big population that I'm seeing out there is people in, you know, the trades and in construction. Like there's still tons of, you know, all the road work and construction going on around Columbus. I'm still seeing, or not Columbus, Milwaukee, um, probably yeah, Columbus yeah. too, when the, the construction. Um, but seeing all these things, um, it's interesting to me how people view certain things as being okay to stop you know like it's okay to shut down certain things or to pause certain things but then other things it's like well we understand but uh you you can't stop you know there's this still like big driving force to continually expand and all these industries you know pushing to you know complete the roads or complete these building projects or complete these you know whatever it may be so it is interesting for me I don't have like a cohesive 
thesis statement on it or anything like that, but it is really kind of interesting and I feel um, like a ton of respect towards these people that are, you know, getting up every day and going out and being on the site, um, you know, outside and in contact with people, but also it's like, you know. They really have a choice. Yeah, they don't have the choice, which is kind of screwed up, you know, you and can't you afford. can stay home, stays home. Yeah, you know, so it's like this really high level of privilege where like, you know, I'm working, I'm working from home, academic institutions, like this super high seat of privilege um, to be able to have that sort of support while during this. Uh oh, we lost it for a second, Ben. Or did we Frozen. lose you? Frozen no. Ben. <laughs> Maybe he'll oh, come back. There he is. Now the eyebrows lifted. Oh, no. <laughs> there you are. No. There he is. Yeah, there yeah. Is. Am I back? Yeah, I believe so. Sorry, it was, it was a few okay. seconds. Where did I leave off? Um, um, but yeah, recognizing the fact that working from home is part of the population is a really high level of privilege this time and just you know, have that privilege able to, because it's an essential part of, you know, their lives, not even society. But yeah, that's kind of a weird runaround answer, but that's all I got. Yeah. yeah. It's definitely going to invoke some weird of it. Yeah. Oh. Oh, he's gone. I think uh, we lost him anyway. Oh. Well, oh, there you there are. He Weird. Am I back? That's all you good. You are. You're back and 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 in in better focus. Oh. Good. Um, we can continue talking. I just want to remind our listeners that we are again an an all volunteer gallery. Um, and Jesse and Ben's pieces are all for sale on our website. Um, please consider donating. We have Cash App and Venmo. Um, and that'll be found in the description of this event and uh, in this post, most likely. So just wanted and, to say that again. Um, and that all of food. our events are always free in the gallery mm -hmm. uh, and are wonderful to attend. And uh, once we're back up and running, we have open hours. Um, yes. So on the weekends. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, so there are lots of ways to contribute, but know that any contribution you make goes straight towards us getting a new broom or paying rent. <laughs> yeah. Um, are there any last things we wanted to touch on um, before we wrap up? I feel like we hit a lot of really good topics tying in how we're being affected with this weird digital interface that yeah. we find ourselves in. Um, yeah, Ben and Jesse, I'll let you take it away if you want to lead any listeners to your websites or pages or anything like that. And all of our and all of your work that's in the show is for sale on our website. You can see each of the pieces. And if you mm -hmm. are interested in seeing uh, up closer or anything like that, you can reach out to 934 Gallery and we can figure something yes. out with the appropriate social distance. We feel really very honored that both to have both of you show in our gallery and to be a part of things. This has been amazing. Yes, the last show to have an opening before quarantine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it was funny. I'm like, man, I'm glad that opening was the day that it was because that probably wouldn't have happened if, uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, even a week later. That was actually something that I had a... No the realization getting back it was just like dang you know that was like the end if you guys want to tell people how to find your work and where to find you and that stuff yeah, yeah. um i guess if we're doing that you know my website is just benyakovone.com super surprising that that wasn't taken um <laughs> definitely if you want to check it out you can but give me like five days to update it so maybe check it next week <laughs> um and yeah i have an instagram that's got some art on it but also a bunch of nonsense um that's on my website as well awesome yeah. thank yes. you guys yeah thank you thank you jesse how do we find your stuff yeah so um 
my website is just my name and it's actually now dot org which is not ideal but dot com I messed up and the dot com went away so now it's jessiehorning.org and of course I don't know how the internet works that well so I don't know how to get that dot com back so um but yeah that's my website jessiehorning.org um and yeah my Instagram is on there but yeah if you just look up my name on Instagram you will find me and yeah there's some weird pictures and pictures of my work as well fantastic we're Very cool. well, it was lovely talking with both of you and with you Ingrid I I think this was a success so thank you to all who have been listening as well I hope you found this talk interesting in, in some way um yeah, join Ingrid, us any... for the next one yes yes we'll be most likely doing this for the foreseeable future until we are able to have open hours again um but yeah on that note i i feel good any last words ingrid before we sign off nope 934 gallery help us out we are here and uh 100 volunteer and really eager to continue creating a culture of art even during the quarantines yes so. very good cool all right and cut <laughs>